Imagine evacuating your home, having to leave your best four-legged friend behind, not knowing whether they will make it either one day due to a Category 5 hur hurricane about to hit. Driving away, you have high hopes of seeing your dog again, because for all you know, the floodgates will hold, but they won't. The floodgates are going to break days later, washing away any hopes that you had of seeing your best friend again. Natural disasters are no joke. They are unpredictable and unstoppable. The U.S. has had some major hits lately due to hurricanes. In some ways, we can protect ourselves, but when it comes down to it, there is no surefire way to prevent the devastating damages natural disasters can cause. The most we can do is help pick up the pieces when the damage is done. That's why we have FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. FEMA is the country's major aid in disaster relief, providing shelter, rescuers, and general supplies to those affected by major disasters. Hello, I'm Don Frazier and this is Rachel Browning. Welcome to Historical Trends. Disasters have been in the news lately. Hurricane Harvey punished the Texas Gulf Coast and Irma smacked into the Caribbean and then rumbled up the west coast of Florida. Then Maria has completely crippled Puerto Rico. Yes, Dr. Frazier, there has been a lot of suffering and devastation because of these storms. The property loss and damage will run into the billions and will take years to repair and make right. Who is going to fix all of this? Well, we've grown used to relying on, on the government to, to address the recovery. Since 1979, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, has been the most visible of all the organizations moving in to help. There's also the Red Cross and other large charitable organizations. In Texas, it was neighbors and other Americans that rushed in, like the Cajun Navy, boat owners from Louisiana, who have a lot of experience with flood rescues. Even the Mexican Army came up to help. All this is true. Did you know that disaster relief hasn't always been organized and that the federal government hasn't always been a player? I'm not surprised. I've had my suspicions. but. I'll let you unpack the history on how the United States deals with disaster response. Great. First, let's take a break for a slice of pie with Dr. Phil LeMasters. All right. It all started on Valentine's Day in 1986 when a poor but honest theological student was trying to win the heart of an aspiring pediatrician. He somehow stumbled on the recipe for this unique pie. Baked her one. And the rest is history. Rejoice, my friend. For today, the rare joy brought by this storied pastry is yours. Pie Masters, your favorite kind of pie. And we're back. Okay, Rachel, tell me about how I'm, I would come back if a hurricane hit my city. Well, before we get into how we handle natural disasters now, let's talk a little bit about how natural disasters were handled before any sort of plan was implemented. Okay. Though FEMA was officially implemented in 1979, the framework for the organization began in the early 20th century. At that time, disaster relief was tackled on a case-by-case -case basis. And then in 1917, during World War I, the federal government began to formalize federal disaster relief. The War Department issued a special regulation, number 67, forming the first type of disaster relief, which was originally called Regulations Governing Flood Relief in the War Department. That doesn't fit on a bumper sticker. It's a, long That's a little tough, yeah. <laughs> and despite the name, uh, it provided relief for all types of disasters, not just floods. Even with the military initiative, federal disaster relief remained informal until the 1950s. Before 1950, it was not expected for the federal government to help with, di with disaster relief. Most thought of that as a job for the local communities. Mm. The beginning of the Cold War in 1950 provoked federal officials to absorb, uh, absorb disaster relief into the federal civil defense. This was accomplished by passing the 
the Federal Disaster Relief Act of 1950, which was designed specifically to decre decrease the economic impact of disasters. Mm, you think they're thinking of nuclear weapons, maybe, but yeah. The original 1950s act was, was to be restricted in range, activated only on presidential disaster declarations, and created only to assist state and local authorities. Once the federal government committed itself to an official, co official capacity within the system, it became a topic of immense criticism every time disaster relief was less than ideal. Mm. I bet most people watching this never really thought about hurricanes hitting the U.S. back in time. No doubt. But the worst of, them, worst of them hit Galveston, Texas. Also known as the Great Storm of, of 1900, Galveston Hurricane was a Category 4 hurricane which killed up to 12,000 people when it came ashore on September 8th. That's a lot of folks. Yeah. This storm was not only the deadliest of, in U.S. history, but adjusted for inflation, perhaps the second most costly. Due to contradictory forecasts, Galveston citizens were not, not concerned about the hurricane until the warning on September 7th. They had one day to prepare. Wow. In the span of 21 days, this hurricane had managed to kill 6,000 to 12,000 people. Most drowned outright in the tidal surge, or got wiped out by debris propelled by the crashing waves. Others survived the storm itself, but died days later from being trapped under the wreckage where rescuers were unable to save them. The amount of bodies discovered was so vast that it was impossible to bury them all. The dead were initially weighted down and dumped in a sea. Gross, I know. Oh. The Gulf currents washed many bodies back up to shore. Oh, wow, you're back. <laughs> Due to the excess bodies cropping up on shore, funeral pyres were set up near the shore and burned consistently for several weeks after the storm. Oh. Authorities handled out, handed out free whiskey free of charge to the men doing the gruesome job of gathering and burning the dead. What a horror story. Okay, so who helped Galveston rebuild? Massive calamities had mostly been a matter of local law enforcement, charities, churches, and government. The federal authorities, authorities did not intervene in a meaningful way. The first real response to federal government to a natural disaster came in 1927 when Mississippi River jumped its banks and flooded swaths of Arkansas, Louisiana, and the state of Mississippi. President Herbert Hoover was the hero of this incident and took the unprecedented step of releasing federal funds to the states to help them rebuild. He also unleashed the power of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to redesign the Lower Mississippi River in an attempt to try and lessen the catastrophic flooding to, that occurs from time to time. So, at first, a federal response would have been rather ad hoc. Yes, but the pattern had been set. The, the federal government might help if needed. It wasn't until 1979 that this help was more thoroughly formalized with the formation of FEMA. President Jimmy Carter implemented FEMA on April 1, 1979. FEMA is now located within the Department of Homeland Security and is responsible for coordinating the federal government's response to natural and man-made disasters. After the September 11th terror attacks, Congress passed the Homeland Security Act of 2002, which, was, which formed the Department of Homeland Security to better communicate among various federal agencies. In March 2003, FEMA was absorbed into the DHS, making it part of the Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate of the Department of Homeland Security. Wow. <laughs> so, why was FEMA formed? On their website, FEMA states their mission is to support the citizens and first responders to promote that, as a nation, we work together to build, sustain, and improve our capability to prepare for, protect against, respond to, recover from, and mitigate all hazards. <laughs> Well, that's quite the chore. So as time has passed, the federal government has taken a more active role in disaster response. However, sometimes they get hammered for not doing enough or not doing it right. That's true, too. Let's take a look at some recent disasters as examples. First, let's look at Hurricane Katrina. On August 25, 2005, Katrina hit the coast of Florida as a Category 1 hurricane. It passed over the, that peninsula, then regained strength in the Gulf of Mexico. By the morning of August 28th, Katrina hit New Orleans as a Category 5 hurricane with winds up to 160 miles per hour. Since hurricanes are nothing new, to, new when it comes to New Orleans, many of the citizens chose to wait out the storm instead of evacuating, thinking that the levees would protect them from the worst of it. Turns out, the levees failed. Not all the levees, mostly the ones maintained by local authorities. 
Hurricane Katrina cost $108 billion in damages, and the flooding in New Orleans was the half of it. The storm ruined 300,000 homes, leaving behind an overwhelming amount of damages to cl be cleaned up and repaired. The death toll topped out at nearly 2,000, a large amount of them in New Orleans. FEMA received immense criticism because of hur Hurricane Katrina. Much of this criticism was due to the sluggish response to the disaster and lack of efficiency in accommodating those trying to leave the city. Katrina was considered one of the, one of the first tests of FEMA held under the DHS. The U.S. House of Representatives Select Bipartisan Committee, who investigated the preparation and response to Hurricane Katrina, stated that for years emergency management professionals have been warning that FEMA's preparedness has eroded. The combination of staffing, training, and organizational structures made FEMA's inadequate performance in the face of a disaster the size of Katrina all but inevitable. Mm. Okay. Of course, the criticism to the Katrina response also dredged up accusations of racism, since many of the victims were African Americans. It looks as though the poor response was mostly because FEMA wasn't prepared. The local authorities, too, could have handled their response better. There was plenty of blame to go around. Now, let's look at a more recent disaster, Hurricane Harvey. Well, Hurricane Harvey began consuming the headlines on August 17th before coming ashore at Rockport, Texas, and then spinning slowly up the coast to, to the east. By August 29th, Hurricane Harvey had affected 48,000 homes, 17,000 with major damages, and 1,000 completely destroyed in Houston alone. Mm. In the span of four days, many areas received more than 40 inches of rain, causing intense flooding. This flooding displaced over 30,000 people and resulted in 17,000 rescues. As of now, there are 83 confirmed fatalities from Hurricane Harvey. From the overall damages, Hurricane Harvey could quite possibly be one of the costliest storms to hit America. The estimated cost of Harvey is $70 billion, making it unofficially the third costliest tropical cyclone in U.S. history. Wow. Major disaster declaration was declared for Hurricane Harvey on August 25th, prompting FEMA to begin taking action. According to FEMA's official website, as of August 31st, nearly 34,000 people sought shelter in more than 240 Red Cross and partner shelters in Texas. Federal, state, and local search teams began to seek out the many inaccessible stranded areas. U.S. Coast Guard and Texas National Guardsmen began transporting supplies and volunteers in areas of greater concern, and approximately 53,000 pounds of medical equipment and supplies were deployed to affected areas. Here are some commodities that FEMA has provided, according to their website for areas affected by Hurricane Harvey. In Texas, FEMA provided more than 1,900,000 meals, more than 1,960,000 liters of water, more than 4,700 blankets, and more than 1,400 cots. In Louisiana, FEMA provided more than 416,000 meals, more than 414,000 liters of water. That sounds like a massive response. In our next segment, Let's talk about these hurricanes and the federal response. Great. We'll be right back with more historical trends. McMurray University, founded in 1923 as a United Methodist institution, is a student-centered community that empowers its graduates to lead lives of meaning through scholarship, leadership, and service. McMurray University is located in Abilene, Texas, about 150 miles west of Dallas-Fort Worth. McMurray University has over 10,000 alumni living all over the United States, as well as in 11 different countries. With over 1,200 students, McMurray offers over 40 clubs and organizations and 19 NCAA intercollegiate sports. McMurray University offers over 45 academic majors, including 10 pre-professional programs with a 13 to 1 student to faculty ratio. The 52 acre campus located in the heart of Abilene offers opportunities to explore the beautiful West Texas area. Ninety percent of McMurray students receive financial aid. 
Missouri University was listed as number 18 on the list of best regional colleges west by the U.S. News & World Report in 2015. information, visit admissions.mcm.edu or call 325-793-4700. We're back and now it's time for the Q&A segment. Right. Okay, so what can we do to make FEMA better? Well, you know, some people I have talked to and I've read uh, editorial responses uh, to this effect as well, is some people wonder if we even need FEMA. So let's start with a more fundamental question. Do we need FEMA or don't we? And if we do need FEMA, how can we make it more responsive to the needs of the people that are suffering? So I don't know if this is a question of mission or if this is a question of efficiency or you know, really what we need to do with FEMA. Uh, it has become a political hot potato as well. Anytime you're spending government funds on a project, it becomes inherently political. So if you want to make the government look bad, then you can complain about the inefficiencies of FEMA. If you want to make the government look good, then you crow about how well they came in to ease the suffering of the people that are hurting. So it's kind of a tricky question. And along those lines, uh, what's your opinion on the political aspect of FEMA? Well, I think it is, um, it's very politicized, unfortunately. And then you throw in the elements of um, identity politics, where all of a sudden, well, FEMA worked well in Texas because it was just rescuing white people, which is a lie. And it worked poorly in New Orleans, where it was mainly affecting African-Americans, which is also a lie. And now FEMA's not working so well in Puerto Rico, and those people are, of course, Hispanic. You know, all of a sudden you can't figure out well, can we just get on with recovering from disasters instead of actually having to deal with the racial aspects of this? It's, uh, that's the only problem with having the government come to the rescue, is that government intervention is inherently political. You mentioned Puerto Rico. What's your opinion on that and the FEMA and controversy? Well, you know, it's interesting. When you have Katrina, when you have Texas, uh, Hurricane Harvey, you can drive a truck from Chicago to Houston and pass out water. When you're talking about Puerto Rico, you're talking about a fairly remote place uh, where you're having to do disaster response. Been to Puerto Rico. It is a very mountainous country. This is not a, a flat, easily accessible uh, place. So once you get to Puerto Rico, your problems are really only beginning. You know, you've traveled a thousand miles by boat with your supplies, then when you get there, you figure out, wait, there's a lot of mountains here. <laughs> and those mountains harbor remote villages. Uh, Puerto Rico's been without power. I mean, it knocked down power lines. Power stations are all up and running, but the infrastructure of the grid is down. And so if you don't have power, you don't have things like refrigeration, you don't have power going to hospitals, it compounds the disaster. Then you try to get up into the mountains, and the storm wrecked bridges, it blocked roadways, washed away roads. It's just a, it's an exponentially more difficult problem than dealing with a disaster that, say, within the continental United States. So FEMA is taking it on the chin because there's still people suffering, you know, weeks after the event. Couple that with Puerto Rico being an economic basket case. You know, they're broke and it's been mismanaged and misrun by its government, and so they can't even do a local response that has any teeth. Uh, they've let the, the infrastructure deteriorate. Then you have some very vocal uh, opponents of the federal government that are in positions of power in Puerto Rico. So in a lot of ways, there's some passive aggression <laughs> going on as well. So Puerto Rico doesn't, it's not even in the same league as Harvey, with uh, Houston and the Texas Gulf Coast, or Katrina, uh, and southern Louisiana. So it's, Puerto Rico is a very unique case, and we're going to be talking about Puerto Rico a lot more in coming years than we are even right now.
Now, Rachel, clearly we could talk about, you know, these sorts of questions with FEMA uh, for hours, but we don't have hours. But we do have a break coming up. So after this break, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some of the questions we've gotten from some of our viewers. We'll be right back. Well, I have very vivid memories um, in our living room with a little black and white TV and watching Walt Disney's King of the Wild Frontier. And then, of course, John Wayne in 60. That, that film just blew me away, the music. I saw the movie pretty much as much as I could. I've read pretty much every Alamo book that's out there, you know. So I want the book, I hope the book will be taken seriously. I've tried to write it as I would write anything, you know, so it's, I don't want to pretend to be someone I'm not. I know what they, these documents are and what the artifacts are, but sometimes it takes somebody else to, when their excitement about the importance of something, you know, then you start to realise that you've got quite an impressive collection of stuff. The State House have been very, very good to me. Don Fraser, Steve Harding, and Claudia. There's a lot of time and energy and, and uh, thought gone into it and will be going into it to present it as a, a really good looking respectable book as opposed to something that's just thrown together. There are others out there that are far more knowledgeable about it but, uh, but I'm enthusiastic. Now we're back with viewer questions. Okay, this first question says, how long does it take FEMA to respond to a disaster? Well, the short answer is, it depends. What do you think? Well, for Hurricane Harvey, FEMA supplies and personnel station, were stationed prior to landfall. Well, that makes sense because Texas is a big place. You can park a bunch of this stuff, say, in San Antonio, or park it in places like, you know, the Woodlands or up in Huntsville, Texas, and then when the disaster hits, you can fill back in. Uh, so that makes perfect sense. Little tough to preposition in places like Lower Florida, with you know one road going in and one road going out uh, essentially, or in Puerto Rico, uh, because if you station it on the island, guess what happens when the hurricane hits? All your preposition supplies get wiped out. So what's the next closest island? Uh, you could place it in the Dominican Republic, maybe. Uh, but what if the hurricane shifts? You know, it's a dicier proposition down there in the Caribbean. So, How big does a disaster have to be for FEMA to respond? Well, again, that's you know open to interpretation. What do you think? Well, first, the disaster has to be evaluated by the state. Okay. And if they determine that it can't be handled by, by the state, then they'll contact FEMA for assistance. Okay, so you kind of shoot a flare if you look like it's going to be bigger than you can handle. So then FEMA has to decide if we're going to declare a disaster. Is that what activates it? Yes. Okay. Okay, and the next question is, what other organizations does FEMA partner with? Well, I think FEMA is partnered with many government agencies. There's quite a few. Um, FEMA is partnered with many government resources as well as voluntary organizations. Okay. Some of them are like the National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition, hmm. the International Association of Emergency Managers, the Corporation and National for National and Community Service, and the U.S. Agency for International International Development. You got a thing for you've got a thing Just, for stranded dogs, don't you? That's the first thing I you do mentioned. love puppies. Yeah, I understand. They're, they're easy to love. Yes. We've got one more question, right? Yes, and that is where and who does the money come from to support FEMA? Well. FEMA is a federal agency, so ultimately it's taxpayers. So exactly. the money for FEMA comes from me, comes from you, comes from folks that pay taxes. What's interesting about government involvement in disaster relief is essentially FEMA has become another layer of insurance in a lot of ways. Uh, this is all about risk mitigation, meaning that nobody likes taking risk. So, you know, I want to build a house on the Gulf Coast. Well, what happens on the Gulf Coast from time to time? I don't know. 
hurricane, hurricane, hurricane. Uh, so should I be allowed to build on the Gulf Coast? Or should I have to take insurance? Or if I don't take insurance, is it right for me to rely on the federal government to bail me out if my house gets wiped out in a hurricane? Which means that we're essentially just socializing risk. You know, so because I get to build my house on the Gulf Coast and it gets wiped out by a hurricane, then all of a sudden the federal government steps in to fix it. That's an interesting aspect of FEMA. So is, in many ways, in my opinion, FEMA becomes another layer of insurance that taxpayers pay for. So that's kind of a long way around that question, but we got there. Yeah. Okay, this has been a uh, an interesting segment, interesting episode, a uh, bunch of stuff I'd never really thought about. So uh, a lot of food for thought here. All right, that's all the time we have. I appreciate you uh, bringing all this to us. Thank you. For Historical Trends, I'm Don Frazier. And I'm Rachel Browning. Thanks for watching.